Hello and welcome to your daily pulp. David Avalone here. Mm. I'm going to do something a little different today. I'm going to read something and not tell you what it is and not show you the cover until the very end. Um, this book was originally published very much as pulp. Uh, the author used a pseudonym, uh, which he uses for the main character of the novel. Um, it was published with a very uh, garish and sensationalist cover. Uh, and then, you know, time passes and it becomes part of uh, literary canon and gets treated very differently. But uh, for now, here's a little passage from a book written in... Let's see, early 50s, 53. So same same year as uh, Dad wrote uh, The Tall Dolores and the year before or the same year that Ian Fleming created James Bond. My first experience with junk was during the war about 1944 and 1945. I had made the acquaintance of a man named Norton who was working in a shipyard at the time. Norton, whose real name was Morelli or something like that, had been discharged from the peacetime army for forging a bad paycheck and was classified 4F for reasons of bad character. He looked like George Rath, but was taller. Norton was trying to improve his English and achieve a smooth, affable manner. Affability, however, did not come natural to him. In repose, his expression was sullen and mean, and you knew he always had that mean look when you turned your back. Norton was a hard-working thief, and he did not feel right unless he stole something every day from the shipyard where he worked. A tool, some canned goods, a pair of overalls, anything at all. One day he called me up and said he had stolen a Tommy gun. Could I find someone to buy it? I said, maybe. Bring it over. The housing shortage was getting underway. I paid $15 a week for a dirty apartment that opened onto a companionway and never got any sunlight. The wallpaper was flaking off because the radiator leaked steam, and when there was any when the when there was any steam in it to leak, I had the windows sealed shut against the cold with a caulking of newspapers. The place was full of roaches, and occasionally I killed a bed bug. I was sitting by the radiator, a little damp from the steam, when I heard Norton's knock. I opened the door, and there he was, standing in the dark hall with a big parcel wrapped in brown paper under his arm. He smiled and said, "Hello." I said, come in, Norton, and take off your coat. He unwrapped the Tommy gun, and we assembled it and snapped the firing pin. I said I would find someone to buy it. Norton said, oh, here's something else I picked up. It was a flat yellow box with five one-half grain serrets of morphine, morphine tartrate. This is just a sample, he said, indicating the morphine. I got 15 of these boxes at home, and I can get you more if you can get rid of these. I said, I'll see what I can do. At that time, I had never used any junk, and it did not occur to me to try it. I began looking for someone to buy the two items, and that is how I ran into Roy and Herman. I knew a young hoodlum from upstate New York who was working as a short-order cook in Rikers, cooling off, as he explained. I called him and said I had something to be get rid of and made an appointment to meet him in the Angle Bar on 8th Avenue near 42nd Street. The bar was a meeting place for 42nd Street hustlers, a pe peculiar breed of four-flushing would-be criminals. They are always looking for a setup man, someone to plan jobs and tell them exactly what to do. Since no setup man would have anything to do with people so obviously inept, un unlucky, and unsuccessful, they go on looking, fabricating preposterous lies about their big scores, cooling off as dishwashers, soda jerks, waiters, occasionally rolling a drunk or attending to queer, looking, always looking for the setup man, with a big job will say, I've been watching you, you're the man I need for this setup. Now listen. Jack, through whom I met Roy and Herman, was not one of these lost sheep looking for the shepherd with a diamond ring and a gun in a shoulder holster and the hard, confident voice with overstones of connections, fixes, setups that would make a stick-up sound easy and sure of success. Jack was very successful from time to time and would turn up in new clothes and even new cars. He was also an inveterate liar who seemed to lie more for himself than for any visible audience. He had a clean-cut, healthy, country face, but there was something curiously diseased about him. He was subject to sudden fluctuations in weight, like a diabetic or a sufferer from liver trouble. These changes in weight were often accompanied by an uncontrollable fit of restlessness, 
so that he would disappear for some days. The effect was uncanny. You would see him one time, a fresh-faced kid. A week later, a week or so later, he would turn up so thin, sallow, and old-looking you would have to look twice to recognize him. His face was lined with suffering in which his eyes did not participate. It was suffering, a suffering of his cells alone. He himself, the conscious ego that looked out of the glazed, alert, calm, hoodlum eyes, would have nothing to do with this suffering of his rejected other self, a suffering of the nervous system, of flesh and viscera and cells. He slid into the booth where I was sitting and offered it, ordered a shot of whiskey. He tossed it off, put the glass down, and looked at me with his head tilted a little to one side and back. What's this guy got? he said. Tommy gun and about 35 grains of morphine. The morphine I can get rid of right away, but the Tommy gun may take a little time. Two detectives walked in and leaned on the bar, talking to the bartender. Jack jerked his head in their direction. The law. I'd take a walk. I followed him out of the bar. He walked through the door, sliding sideways. I'm taking you to someone who will want the morphine, he said. You want to forget this address. We went down to the bottom level of the independent subway. Jack's voice, talking to his invisible audience, went on and on. He had a knack of throwing his voice directly into your consciousness. No external noise drowned him out. Give me a 38 every time. Just flip back the hammer and let her go. I'll drop anyone at 500 feet. Don't care what you say. My brother has two 30 caliber machine guns stashed in Iowa. We got off the subway and began to walk on snow-covered sidewalks between tenements. The guy owed me for a long time, see? I knew he had it, but he wouldn't pay. So I waited for him when he finished work. I had a roll of nickels. No one can hang anything on you for carrying U.S. currency. Told me he was broke. I cracked his jaw and took my money off him. Two of his friends standing there, but they kept out of it. I'd have switched a blade on them. We were walking up ten tenement stairs. The stairs were made out of worn black metal. We stopped in front of a narrow, metal-covered door, and Jack gave an elaborate knock, inclining his head to the door like a safecracker. The door was opened by a large, flabby, middle-aged queer, with tattooing on, it, tattooing on his forearms and even on the backs of his hands. This is Joey, Jack said. And Joey said, hello there. Jack pulled a $5 bill from his pocket and gave it to Joey. Get us a quart of Shenley's, will you, Joey? Joey put on an overcoat and went out. In many tenement apartments, the front door opens directly into the kitchen. This was such an apartment, and we were in the kitchen. After Joey went out, I noticed another man who was standing there looking at me. Waves of hostility and suspicion flowed out from his large brown eyes like some sort of television broadcast. The effect was almost like a physical impact. The man was small and very thin, his neck loose in the collar of his shirt. His complexion faded from brown to mottled yellow, and pancake makeup had been heavily applied in an attempt to concealed a skin eruption. His mouth was drawn down at the corners in a grimace of petulant annoyance. Who's this? He said. His name, I learned later, was Herman. Friend of mine. He's got some morphine he wants to get rid of. Herman shrugged and turned out his hands. I don't think I want to bother, really. Okay, Jack said. We'll sell to someone else. Come on, Bill. We went into the front room. There was a small radio, a china Buddha with a votive candle in front of it, pieces of bric-a-brac. A man was lying on a studio couch. He sat up as we entered the room and said hello and smiled pleasantly, showing discolored brownish teeth. It was a southern voice with the accent of East Texas. Jack said, Roy, this is a friend of mine. He has some morphine he wants to sell. The man sat up straighter, swung his legs off the couch. His jaw fell slackly, giving his face a vacant look. The skin of his face was smooth and brown, the cheekbones were high, and he looked oriental. His ears stuck out at right angles from his asymmetrical skull. The eyes were brown, and they had a peculiar brilliance, as though points of light were shining behind them. The light in the room glinted on the points of light in his eyes like an opal. How much do you have? he asked me. Seventy-five half-grain surrettes? The regular price is two dollars a grain, he said, but surrettes go for a little less. People want tablets. These surrettes have too much water, and you have to squeeze the stuff out and cook it down. He paused, and his face went blank. I could go about 150 a grain, he said finally. I guess that would be okay, I said. He asked how we could make contact, and I gave him my phone number. Joey came back with the whiskey, and we all had a drink. 
Herman stuck his head in from the kitchen and said to Jack, Could I talk to you for a minute? I could hear them arguing about something. Then Jack came back and Herman stayed in the kitchen. We all had a few drinks and Jack began telling a story. My partner was going through the joint. The guy was sleeping and I was standing over him with a three-foot length of pipe. I found it in the bathroom. The pipe had a faucet on the end, see? All of a sudden he comes up and jumps straight out of the bed running. I let him have it with the faucet end and he goes running right out into the other room, the blood spurting out of his head ten feet every time his heart beat. He made pumping motion with his hand. You could see the brain there and the blood coming out. Jack began to laugh uncontrollably. My girl was waiting out in the car. She called me. <laughs> she called me a cold-blooded killer. <laughs> he laughed until his face was purple. A few nights after meeting Roy and Herman, I used one of the Surrettes, which was my very first experience with junk. A Surrette is like a toothpaste tube with a needle on the end. You push a pin down through the needle, the pin punctures the seal, and the Surrette is ready to shoot. Morphine hits the back of the legs first, then the back of the neck, a spreading wave of relaxation, slackening the muscles away from the bones so that you can seem to float without outlines, like lying in warm salt water. As this relaxing wave spread through my tissues, I experienced a strong feeling of fear. I had the feeling that some horrible image was just beyond the field of vision, moving as I turned my head so I never quite saw it. I felt nauseous. I lay down and closed my eyes. A series of pictures passed, like watching a movie. A huge, neon-lighted cocktail bar that got larger and larger until streets, traffic, and street repairs were included in it. A waitress carrying a skull on a tray, stars in the clear sky. The physical impact of the fear of death. The shutting off of breath. The stopping of blood. I dozed off and woke up with a start of fear. Next morning, I vomited and felt sick until noon. Roy called that night. About what we were discussing the other night, I could go about $4 for a box and take five boxes now. Are you busy? I'll come over to your place. We'll come to some kind of agreement. A few minutes later, he knocked at the door. He had a Glen plaid suit and a dark coffee-colored shirt. We said hello. He looked around blankly and said, If you don't mind, I'll take one of these now. I opened the box. He took out a cigarette and injected it into his leg. He pulled up his prance briskly and took out $20. I put five boxes on the kitchen table. I think I'll take them out of the boxes, he said, too bulky. I began putting the serrets in his coat pockets. I don't think they'll perforate this way, he said. Listen, I'll call you again in a day or so after I get rid of these and have some more money. He was adjusting his hat over his asymmetrical skull. I'll see you. Next day he was back. He shot another serrette and pulled out $40. I let out 10 boxes and kept two. These are for me, he said. He looked at me surprised. You use it? Now and then. It's bad stuff, he said, shaking his head. The worst thing that can happen to a man. We all think we can control it at first. Sometimes we don't want to control it, he laughed. I'll take all you can get at this price. The next day he was back. He asked if I didn't want to change my mind about selling the two boxes. I said no. He bought two serrettes for a dollar each, shot them both, and left. He said he had signed up for a two-month trip. So, possibly there, it's pretty easy to imagine what book this is and who wrote it, uh, but the reveal. Of course, this is from Junkie by William S. Burroughs, originally credited to William Lee, who's the main protagonist in the book. You know, there's some, uh, I hate the term politically correct, but there's some uh, language in there that would not fly today. Um, in fact, including the use of queer, which is, of course, the, the title of Burroughs' second unpublished novel that was published years later. Uh, but Junkie, as I said before, was published like a the cheap paperback it was. It did not establish William Burroughs as a, literary phenomenon that came about when he wrote uh, Naked Lunch a few years later. One of the reasons I wanted to read this uh, as part of this series is just a reminder that pretty much anything can come out in a cheap paperback on cheap pulp paper. And uh, the thing about Burroughs, which I find interesting, my dad, uh, I gave him this to read, and he said, the thing is Burroughs writes like a hard-boiled detective writer. He just 
clearly had no interest in telling those kind of stories. If he had wanted to, he could have turned that, which I think you saw in those passages, the gift for observation, for catching people in a snapshot, for conveying character quickly and economically. Uh, all that is there in very vivid prose. But uh, Burroughs, you know, it's that thing, it's like Picasso. The man could draw pretty pictures all the live long day if he wanted to. He just didn't want to. And I think the same is true of Burroughs. Uh, so that's today's Pulp Fiction, Junkie by William Lee. Chin Chin.